This is La Mata Negra, a beach located in Huelva, Spain. 80 years ago, a secret washed ashore, a secret that would change the tides of World War II. A fisherman named Antonio Ray Maria discovered a body of a Royal Marine named Major William Martin. He would have no idea that the body would be part of one of the strangest and yet boldest deception plans ever greenlit in warfare. Hello everybody and welcome to Lights Camera History. If you enjoy this, please like and comment or subscribe down below. This is our historical review of Operation Mincemeat. Doing the research for this reminded us of why we love history. In 1943, the Allies were planning on invading somewhere in the Mediterranean. No matter what they tried to do, the British needed the Germans to think they were launching their attack into continental Europe somewhere other than their intended target. A few years earlier, in 1939, the Trout Memo would circulate around British intelligence that proposed all sorts of screwball tactics to deceive the Nazis with misinformation. Although the memo is signed by Admiral Godfrey, Many historians, including Ben McIntyre, believe the memo was written by his secretary, Ian Fleming. Yes, that Ian Fleming. Godfrey would later be an inspiration for the M character in the James Bond books Fleming would later write. Bond. James Bond. Fleming. Ian Fleming. One screwball tactic was planting a dead body with papers. Although most of the memo is considered fantastical, this ploy is known as the Haversack Ruse. The idea was at least put down on paper almost four years prior to the operation going active. The plan here was to find a dead body and plant papers on him to make the enemy think that you're going to invade Greece and Sardinia, instead of the more likely an actual target, Sicily. The trick is not to be too obvious about it. You want them to think they're smart and put the clues together. The hardest part of this plan is locating a corpse that could pass for a drowning. On January 28, 1943, a London coroner contacted MI5 with the news he had located a suitable body. Glendowell Michael, a homeless man who died from eating rat poison that contained phosphorus. According to the coroner, finding the poison would be difficult to detect after so many days at sea. So, Gwendolyn Michael, a man that was believed to have mental health issues, malnourished, and very little family, would be promoted to Major under the name Major William Martin. He would be loaded with fake documents hinting at an invasion in Sardinia, dressed as a Marine, and loaded on the HMS Serap, and raised discreetly to the surface in the hopes that he would catch the attention of the Nazi intelligence community. Although it's a small part of the story, it needs to be brought up. In World War II Britain, there was a large team of talented and well-placed Nazi spies all throughout the empire. The Nazi spy ring worked like this. They were recruited from every corner of the empire. They were from all different jobs, skills, countries, and ideologies. They included a pilot courier, a secretary in the cabinet office, Carlos, a rich Venezuelan, students, defectors, messengers, and 23 others, including the man himself, who the Germans gave the code name Arabelle, which translates as prayerful. Arabelle was a translator with lots of friends in high places. He could send radio messages instantly, letters or items hidden inside things like cakes. His spy ring had eyes and ears everywhere, all devout Nazis loyal to the cause, dedicated servants of Hitler bound to bring the world under Nazi rule. All well-placed, smart, and well-funded. Except, the thing is, none of them were real. They were all on Team Crown, all fake and all still getting paid. These spies were the invention of a man named Juan Garcia, codename Garbo to Five. He would feed the Nazis either what MI5 called chicken feed, information too late, or conflicting information. For example, the spies had a rating system that Garbo would write about. He had favorites, which allowed him to play games with information. It would go like this. So spy number two had some information that is fake or to plant certain ideas to the Nazis I command. But spy number six has something that an invasion force is moving somewhere and is actually true. Spy number two would have the favorite intelligence that fit what the Nazis wanted to hear. Spy number six had the real information, but loaded with blank spaces. That way, when the real event happened, Garbo could say, well, you got the information. I don't judge. I just pass on. Oh, and the money they were being paid was going to MI5. 
These fake spies could have easily brought the plan down had it not been for the fact that Garbo could verify whatever was needed, or simply not find anything of use. Now, with all that hard work put into place, none of it would matter if Baron Alexis von Ron, the intelligence officer in charge of vetting information before it got to the old Fuhrer himself, was able to pick it apart. Unlike the efforts of some German spies who were losing the intelligence war by accident thanks to Garbo, Ron was losing it on purpose. The man hated Hitler. He was deeply religious and thought if he aided him, he would not be able to look God in the eye. So when the report from Spain came to his desk, he took a good hard look at it, could see how ridiculous it was. It all just felt too calculated, too perfect. In other words, Baron knew it was a hoax. So what does he do? He sent the report to Hitler with his stamp of approval. Other moments where he helped the Allies was exaggerating troop levels to influence military decisions. In Operation Fortitude, when asked to evaluate the 1st United States Army Group, or FUSAG, or FUSAG, he knew the Allies were trying to convince the Nazis a massive invasion force was just across the channel from Paz de Calais and help keep up the ruse. However, he would not survive the war. He was executed as a conspirator in July 20th in a plot to assassinate Hitler. It's not believed that he really had that much to do with the plot. Although he is not mentioned, Juan Pujo deserves credit for keeping the British ahead on the intelligence war. Without him, this plan would not have been possible. Operation Mincemeat was directed by John Madden and stars Colin Firth as Ewan Montague, Matthew McFadden as Charles Comondoli, Kelly McDonald as Jean Leslie, Penelope Wilton as Hester Leggett, and John Flynn as Ian Fleming. The movie is now available on Netflix, so if you haven't seen it, check it out. There are a few key inaccuracies worth mentioning. Montague's brother Ivor was a committed communist, and although it's well known he was a member of the Communist Party, the British were certain he was not spying. Although Soviet Russia had spied all throughout Europe, he was determined not to be one of them. Another inaccurate moment is the scene with Captain David Answorth in the park. This was fictional. The biggest misconception was the love triangle. There is no evidence that Comondoli, Montague, and Jean Leslie were involved in one. However, this chews up a large chunk of the movie. The last bit we have is the visit to Leslie by a Nazi spy. The scene depicts the spy visiting Leslie and threatening her to reveal the truth. Although this is fictional, MI5 contends that surely the Nazi intelligent apparatus checked on some of the details of Major Bill Martin's life. To what extent, it's hard to know. It is clear her work with MI5 was well hidden, so she couldn't have been targeted since she was doing the work in the shadows. Even if it was true, their spies were really working for the other team anyway. The movie deserves credit for nailing the actual tension the three main characters felt in real life. On the eve of the submarine Serap, Ewan Montague said he was the most nervous person in the world. Well, there you have it. We give this movie an A. The movie does a terrific job of putting the stress on the characters and the play-by-play -play of the development of the plan. It's always worth mentioning that Major William Martin was a real person. He likely died from poison that was purposely put on bread to kill rats on the street. His grave, pictured here, depicts both his real name and the one he bore post-mortem to swing the tides in favor of the Allies and help bring a terrible war closer to its inevitable end. His final resting place is still at the Hackney Mortuary in Ulva, Spain. We'll leave you with this thought. The next time you're at the beach, Remember, it's always been a place for secrets. The ocean vast has always buried man's secrets in its deep waters.